Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Fantasy Kickabout. Um, this one, we're about halfway through the Euros, and so obviously we did a Euros preview episode, episode there last time. So we're going to follow on with that and just chat about the tournament that has happened so far, if we're enjoying it, um, you know, predictions for how the uh, tournament's going to finish up and all the nitty-gritty in between. So joining me today, I have Dave Dent and Gary Quinn, back to regulars. And so, yeah, we're going to dive straight in. Um, so, Dave, I'm going to start with you. <clears throat> Sorry, before we even, you know, analyse any of the groups or potential ties that are coming up, you're enjoying the Euros, are you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was one of those ones where I think, you know, with uh, being a United fan, come to the end of the season, you know, wasn't exactly the feel good factor we had we we'd kind of wanted, especially with the Europa League final and everything else. So I wasn't really G'd up to 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 enjoy the Euros. And I think, you know, it's five years and since the last one. And you nearly forget, you know, the excitement that you can that you can get caught up in. So yeah, loving it. The football's been great. We've had great moments. We've had, you know, everything, everything that you could want from a tournament. So yeah, it's been great. Brilliant. Guys, you the same? Yeah, very much so. Um you look just just for me, summer football, summer tournaments, you can't beat it. Um, regardless of what competition, what countries are involved. Um, but just speaking of actually countries involved, for any of our, our listeners, um, Dave Dent is the only person representing a team that's still in the Euros. Um, as my, myself and O'Hara have between us German, Swedish, Portuguese, Dutch, Scottish jerseys. Yeah, I do have obviously a Sandro, but that's not representing England. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's it's been it's been really enjoyable. Um, I think we're all devastated that there's no football on tonight. Um, and that just really shows what uh, what sort of a, a tournament it has been so far. Yeah, we don't really know what to do with ourselves, do we? But yeah, so I suppose it was a good opportunity to uh, spend the evening just chatting about football instead of watching it. Um, but it has, it's been really enjoyable. Um, I, I don't know what we'll do when it's over, to be honest. We'll have nearly a month without football. We'll probably go through with uh, withdrawal symptoms. But... Um, I'm sure there'll be some nonsense in the transfer market to keep us busy. Um, so, yeah, so I suppose actually talking about the tournament um, and some specific teams, maybe. Um, guys, I was actually, I listened back to our, our preview podcast um, just to see where any of the, the wild calls, uh, did they come through or anything? Um, as far as I remember, both yourself and Anto had Ukraine top in Group B. Um quite comfortably as far as I remember but um obviously that didn't transpire but they just about qualified and you know are, are still in with the shout they're scraping through each time and are looking decent enough um yeah I suppose if we if we go kind of briefly through the groups um if you think maybe off the top of your head what was your favorite group to watch or a few of your standout moments from the group stages first of all I will say that my pre-tournament predictions were were way off, probably with with a majority of of the groups that didn't predict it. Uh, Turkey to top the group to get out of the group to potentially get as far as a semi final. They were your big one, yeah. At which they just completely all this they just didn't turn up whatsoever, um, and I suppose people then were saying obviously Italy were dark horses but I don't think you can ever call the Italian team or even the Germans for example dark horses when they're at a major tournament because they always tend to be there thereabouts I know there's obviously disappointing tournaments but they're, they're always there thereabouts Um, kind of the the, the groups off the, the top of my head obviously kind of I, I think I predicted the, the Dutch to finish second and potentially struggle a bit in the group Um, and looking back I really did think they actually struggled in the Ukraine game, but they then kind of really turned it on. Like they had obviously really good moments in, in that Dutch game. Obviously the most important thing is getting the win regardless, but then they kind of really turned it on for the, the next couple of games. And then obviously a huge shock, them getting knocked out um, by Czech Republic. Um, kind of, I suppose, two 
smash and grab, grab goals once they went down to um to 10 men so again i probably yeah i think i predicted the, the dutch to get maybe to the the, the round of, of 16 um, I'm trying to think of of what group. Obviously, the, the group of death was quite exciting because you had big nations against each other, and those games. Obviously, the the, Port, the Portugal Germany game. What was it? Six goals that, that were that were scored, which was obviously great as as a neutral to sit down and and, and watch it. And um, even the France Portugal game, even flicking to the the Germany Hungary game on the final day for that group was was quite exciting to, to, to watch. And obviously Hungary were, were no pushovers within that group. And now we looked at the group of that, they're all pretty much dead and gone. Um, so, yeah, there's been a couple of kind of standouts, probably Italy topping it most. And I might be uh, controvers- controversial in saying this, but I do, really do think far the the Scotland game, maybe a bit of the Czech Republic game because England had already qualified, but they've gone about the, the, the business the right way and maybe we might touch on it uh, later on uh, throughout the podcast. Yeah, 100%. Um, Dave, what about yourself? Any other standouts from the group stages? Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, the group that, that I was most excited about was uh, the Belgian group because, you know, we had everybody had built up the, the group of death which um which which essentially became a group of death they all died and they all left um and and even in those games you know the the france france germany game like it was a fine game the france the the germany portugal game had loads of goals and it. it was a good game but i i, I just felt that the I was more excited about the Danes after after a, a horrific opening game um and everything happening with Christian Eriksen and how the the Finnish fans had supported the Danes and like just the way it all kind of unfolded and it was a it was a relatively tight group you know um I know Belgium came came through a comfortably winners but but Denmark had them on the rack in in that in their game, you know, they really could have put put uh, Belgium to the sword if they'd if they'd uh, maybe just finished a little bit better. But they had so many chances, and and they really could have they really could have thrown a uh, thrown them down. So um, that was probably the, the the better group games because the Netherlands came through comfortably. They won their three games. Um, England's group was, you know. It, it was, I, I don't want to call it boring, but you know the the England Croatia game was a, was a good game, but they've managed to get themselves to the quarterfinals by only scoring three goals. Um, it, it's just staggering, <laughs> you know. Um, but just the other groups kind of went the way you know the Spanish group w- wasn't exactly thrilling either. So I just thought uh, of all of them, uh, I was kind of tuned in to see how how that one was going to unfold because it could have been any three of them you know but when it came to the when it came to the final day but i agree with gaz i, I think on with the group of death there was a lot of flicking back and forth <laughs> to see who was going where and um uh, as each goal went in the, the they were changing positions you know but um yeah uh, i agree also with gaz that calling italy a dark horse should never be a thing you know you, you can't win the world cup as many times as they have and, and be as successful as they are and ever call them dark horses you know um denmark are a dark horse switzerland are a dark horse and now are, now ukraine are you're like they're still in the mix they more than likely won't get much further but um but yeah, I think those sort of terms need to be reserved reserved for those guys. But Denmark in particular, you know, that they've they've reacted and they've they've been so impressive, you know. So I think uh, I think we can we can nick them as dark horses from from now on. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, the Denmark story, because you know, often with these tournaments, there ends up being you know nice stories running through as the tournament develops, like. Going back to the Ericsson thing, for them to have such a traumatic start to the tournament, like I don't know, like I, I assume with you guys, we were all talking about it at the time, like it was it was shocking, it was terrifying to watch and to not know what was happening to him and he had been down for so long, it didn't look good. To then, you know, be be asked basically to play the game that day, 
you know, they were obviously weren't in the heads about for it. Um, and like played decent, decent enough in the second game, but were unlucky against Belgium. Um, so it looked like it was going to be kind of a hard luck story. You know, Ericsson obviously generally being their best player, it was it looked kind of like it was going to peter out into, oh, they were, you know, the worst luck in the world to, for how it turned out. Mm-hmm. For them then to have rallied and like their their last 16 game where they won 4-0, you know, is one of the most impressive performances in the last 16 games. Um, <laughs> the first team to win 4-0 back to back in in the euros if i'm not wrong yeah like they've been they've been one of the most impressive teams really if you look at their games and you know regardless of who you think are bigger teams they've absolutely been one of the most impressive teams um but yeah i was just obviously looking at the group tables afterwards you know if you look at them now when they've all unfolded they all generally look kind of as you would have maybe predicted at the start bar maybe one or two but the new the, the format of the Euros this year has meant it's been really interesting up until the last day. Because up until the last day, you know, Spain were looking like they might necessarily qualify. Um, as you said, they're like the group of death. On the last day, sure, Portugal had, had different points were in each of the four spots. Um, so maybe just touching on on the on the format for a few minutes as well. Um, the way four of the six third place teams qualified kept it really really interesting up until the end of the groups um how did you enjoy your career what do you think of the format um i suppose initially i wasn't too sure because i kind of felt maybe this potentially favors the the bigger nations or the more successful nations but I suppose, as obviously Dave touched on, and, and you did too there, O'Hara, about the, the Danish story, if that rule didn't exist, the Danish wouldn't have been in the... Uh, obviously, the, the, they um, finished, obviously, second in, 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 the, in the group, but it kind of just gave them so much hope going into, into a last game as well. Um, just, the, just the Danish story, just obviously go off on a little tangent. Just It's, it's an incredible story how that team came through what they did on, on the pitch that day. U- UEFA, again, kind of get, haven't made themselves look good, haven't made themselves look good at all by p- pretty much demanding that they played that evening or at, I think it was midday the, the, the next day. Um, but what that Danish team have done and the momentum is very much with them. And I think everyone would would love to see them win it. Um, so I suppose, but back to the back to the format. Um, obviously, you had the likes of, of Ukraine managing to to get through. Um, like you said, kind of Spain as well. Um, there was a lot of ups and downs coming into the, the final day, which did, and I agree with Johar, did make things a bit more exciting. Where there, there can tend to be a dead rubber game in a in an international tournament come the the, the last round of, of fixtures. Um, which was, which which, which kind of changed things up. I, I know we kind of debated about the distance some teams are traveling and the locations. Um, that still doesn't sit very well with me. Um, but in terms of the the format, I do think it it has it has worked well, and it probably has surprised me how well it, how well it, it has worked. Well, Dave, what did you think of it? Well, you know, I can understand the theory that, um, that you know, the format favours the big teams, but I think they, UEFA will, will be somewhat proven right in that we look at um, the game last night, Ukraine finished third and, and knocked out Sweden, who finished top of their group. Um, the Swiss knocked out the French who finished top of their group and uh, and then the Czech Republic obviously um, after getting through third and Netherlands comfortably enough coasting through their group um, they were they were put to the sword as well so you know it, it really doesn't matter um, it really doesn't matter where you're finishing in your group uh, because this is cup football and if you're not going to turn up 
and perform uh, as like overwhelmingly that's that's been my sentiment with the French in particular. Um, I know some some teams start competition slow and you know doesn't matter what you do in the group stage and all of that sort of stuff but when you don't turn up and uh, and 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 leave it all out there I mean Denmark what like what a team of leaders you know from uh Kasper Schmeichel and and Kjær their 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 captain um my god what United could do with a couple of players like that like like real real leaders they're they're just they're just immense and you know with uh with, with the format to reel myself back in a little bit um it's worked I like it, it it has it has worked in another year you could you ha- you could have an awful turnout and it could just be seen as a waste of time and just a just a, a formality in order to to get the minnows out of the out of the competition and um, and then get to the big boys but uh it's it's just it's worked and it's made it's made for a, a seriously exciting uh competition yeah it really has um it is interesting though because with the fact that so many of the third place teams were going to get through there's the argument that it favors the smaller teams because then as you said gary like there's usually a dead rubber game because the top two are just coasting away and it doesn't matter if you finish third where so many of them you know if given a good result on the last day that could have then gotten them through as the third place team um you know it had gotten to the point where it looked like you were going to need four points to qualify as a third place team um and then the last couple of days meant that's how Ukraine qualified. You know, Ukraine, I'd say, pretty much had resigned themselves to to not go on to qualify. And then um, with the likes of Group E and F, meant that they scraped through, and they're they're obviously, as we said, still still going strong. Um, it, well, it's a little bit of a fifty fifty, I guess, because like all we need to do is look at the the last eight teams, and we've got Denmark, Czech Republic. Um, Ukraine and Switzerland and those would be considered the um n- nobody nobody would have really predicted that those guys would would be making up half of the the quarter finalists so you know does it make it fairer does it make it does it open it up a little bit more to to not favor either side on um, the 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 quarter finalists this year would suggest that it's a 50 50 practically you know um but i i I, uh, I left out earlier on but i do agree with gary the the only thing about the format that i am totally against is is the amount of traveling and i'm sure i'm sure we'll t- touch on it later on but the um the bouncing back and forth from different cities you know from azerbaijan to italy and then england to Spain to Rome, yeah, like it's just it was that that bit of it it's been, has been crazy. But the, the format, I think, UEFA will will be comfortable enough with how it's unfolded that they uh, that they won't have to back down too much on it. Yeah, I'd say so. Especially as like I, I've been a fan of it, obviously with with a lot of the third place teams qualifying. It would make it interesting if they were trying to make the argument to expand it again, you know, to to thirty two teams. Um, because then if they were to do that then it would just be a case of a couple of more groups and it would be the top two of each where you know there are you know you know the likes of Iceland and stuff there there are decent teams who could make up the last few spots but yeah <laughs> uh, obviously ourselves um, if we if we manage to uh, bring up a few more young lads like like Troy Parrot and stuff like that um but I wonder what it take away from the actual excitement of, of the latter stages of the group stages. Because, as we said already, it could easily just be that there's a load of dead rubber games going into the last game. But anyway, that's, uh, that's <laughs> hypothesising at this point. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a balance, I'm sure. But I think in, like for this tournament in particular, I'm sure that there are a lot of football fans out there who are delighted to see the Swiss come through against the French 
or you know maybe not people like the Swedish so maybe not maybe not Spain Spain and Ukraine but the Netherlands are a huge huge football nation and to, to see them turfed out by the Czechs um which by the way their history with the Czech Republic is absolutely staggering like the fact that they have lost 10 of their last 11 games against them and every red card that they've ever gotten in the Euros has been against the Czech Republic like it's it's crazy I, I, I can't believe I never I had no idea about their history I don't know why anybody would have backed them to get through it just seemed like it was written in the stars but um, no just so many of these games you know I think there's a certain element of we love a comeback we love an underdog and uh, you know, if it was if it was Spain, Italy, France, Germany, um, and, and the Netherlands, and all these guys going into going into the quarters or going into the semis, there'd be an element of that being boring as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I was, I was just going to say, just obviously we were we were saying that, that that it has been an exciting tournament, that it's been good football at times, but how disappointing, like have the were the French. The Spanish to a certain point, um, you could even say Portugal, Germany, um, some of the bigger nations, but especially France. I just felt, even like even in the first game against Germany, I, I felt that they were just in third gear, kind of coasting, and obviously managed to get through that one, get the three points, uh, albeit a, an own goal from Hummels. But then they just couldn't finish their dinner against the Hungarians, and then when it came up against, um. Portugal I thought they were quite poor in that as, as well like to to a certain extent there was I just felt those those bigger nations would say just had moments here and there but those moments didn't really see them over the line and you can go back to the the French Switzerland game where obviously Benzema had those two goals in in a couple of minutes but again it was such passive football from, from the from the French. I know when Pogba, Pogba was probably their best player this this tournament, and he seemed to get on the ball. He was constantly looking up, picking out really good class passes. Um, but Mbappe didn't show up whatsoever. Um, Griezmann, to be honest, I actually felt a bit sorry for Griezmann. I just thought he did an awful lot of work off the ball and made an, made an awful lot of runs to make that space for the likes of Mbappe running in behind for Pogba to pick out. Um, but there was even the, the French defense at times was 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 poor. Um, I, I think Deschamps has to be questioned about his new formation for for the game against the, the Swiss. Um, to revert to three at the back with, with, with two wing backs just didn't really suit them or, or, or make any sense. But um, I, I don't know whether you guys agree with that. But a lot of the bigger nations kind of kind of disappointed. Um, even even when they managed to get through the, the group stages. Yeah, 100%. That's what I was going to say, actually. Um, obviously, with the underdog story, um, the likes of Denmark and Switzerland and, and those, you know, obviously they're the ones that we've been rooting for because people wouldn't have expected them. Um, and, you know, on paper, like, you know, Denmark's last couple of results have been the most um, impressive. But, yeah, that's there's been so many disappointments. Like... Uh, you know, obviously Germany yesterday as well. They just never looked coherent really at any point. You know, obviously they scored a few goals against Portugal, but even still looked a bit shaky at the back and, and conceded too. Um, like France were, were a huge letdown. I totally agree, Gary. Like a lot of people were backing them to be the winners of the tournament. And like it was them or no one at one point before it started. And they never really turned up. Like, obviously, they got, got out of the group, but they were still a bit shaky. <clears throat> Mbappe in the first game looked, you know, there was a couple of times where he got in behind and the pace was phenomenal. And it was like, oh, my God, they're playing hungry next game. He's going to tear them apart. And he, it was like he wasn't playing. He, he barely existed. Um didn't score at all during the tournament. Obviously missed the, de the decisive penalty in the, in the shootout. Um, it was a really surprise. Uh, sorry, a really surprising one because, you know, obviously he was the he was the few years younger at the last tournament, and he absolutely lit the place on fire. Where 
he's had the few years since he's been phenomenal with PSG. The numbers he's putting in is amazing. Um, yeah, but he just totally didn't turn up. But again, as you said, that's not just him. Like it was across the board, really, with all the French players. Um, so yeah, you'd wonder, you'd wonder what it was, really, because they had such a strong squad. You know, we, again, we were chatting before the tournament. You know, a first eleven of players they didn't bring would top a group. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it was bizarre. Definitely, France and Germany for me were the two biggest disappointments. Um, really, like if you look, I to be honest, I thought the Netherlands would do a bit better. Um, I thought they'd get to at least the quarters, um, especially when. The groups were finished and then you saw the full draw for, you know, if you were to win your games, what your run to the final would be. You know, obviously they were on the easier side with um, really the only difficult game you could say was, was the England and Germany match. Other than that, you would have thought they would have beaten any of the other teams. But they just didn't turn up against Czech Republic. Czech Republic are obviously, you know, a tough side to break down very strong defensively. The Netherlands didn't know what to do. They had no way through. You know, so obviously I was up for Netherlands in that game and they were 1-0 down. I was like, okay, come on. There's still, you know, still plenty of time to break them down. We can figure out something. And there was just no way they were going to break them down. And 2-0 was like, yeah, well, what are you going to do? You know, can I just jump for a second? Yeah, yeah, by the way. I actually didn't get to, to see that game, the the um, Netherlands against Czech Republic, but oh, yeah, you were def- you were dropping off dodgy stickers too. Yeah, dropping off dodgy <laughs> stickers to O'Hara, hence why I missed it. But uh, um, just wondering if the Dutch had eleven players on the pitch, would either of you lads seen them coming out with a win, or did Czech Republic one hundred percent deserve it? Because I'm just thinking of the games that I saw Czech Republic play and. And they've obviously one of the main games I watched was the first game against Scotland. And to be honest, I thought Scotland deserved to win that game based on how they played, how they performed, probably created the better chances. And obviously a moment of genius from uh, the Czech um, striker um, and obviously a quality header as well. But was it kind of a smash and grab similar to that? Obviously, albeit against 10 men against the Dutch or yeah, against the Dutch. Um, just I, I did watch the game, um, and the licked getting sent off was hundred percent. That was a turning point, and um, you know, at, at that point, you know, you have to listen. Any 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 play, any team can lose a man at, at some stage, but it's it's kind of how you deal with it. With all respect to the licked, he's a young guy, made a stupid mistake, but he's a young guy, and he wasn't. Like a, he wasn't a huge cog in the wheel of the Dutch. The Dutch team they should have been able to manage without him. Um, obviously, you know Dumfries, who was one of the one of the standout performers of the of the competition up to that point. Like he obviously then needs to be pulling back and. They need to be kind of consolidating and trying to be clever about it, but that just all went went down the toilet. So, like the Czechs could could very well have still edged it. Like it, it was it was a tight enough game with eleven men um, from the first half, but I still think they probably would have would have nudged it. Um, like I'll just touch on a couple of little things just on what you said about the big teams coming into the tournament. Um, I. I can make some sort of excuses for a lot of them, you know, with Germany coming into the tournament, I thought Lowe should have been gone before this tournament. His last, his last, uh, his last run out in the, in the world cup was atrocious. Uh, you know, dropping Muller and dropping Hummels and then changing his mind and bringing them back in. Like he's, he's all over the place. I don't think he should have been there in the first place. So it was a very sketchy sort of lead up. So I can, I can give them a little bit of grace. Um, Spain to be fair are, are just one of those teams where they've, they've lost 
the the uh, the spark that that made them probably one of the best international teams that we've ever seen, and now they've got a a team kind of in transition. I can give a little bit of leeway there. Portugal are are an aging side. You know, obviously Ronaldo was incredible, but he's he's in his mid thirties. They're dealing with you know Matinho. They're dealing with uh, Pepe. Guys who are just they're they're no spring chickens, and you know unless they're able to get the ball get the ball to Ronaldo and for him to finish it, there doesn't seem to really be a a plan B. And um, so I I could ha- kind of have some sort of explanation for the rest. France have no excuse. They like they really have no excuse. They came into the tournament sleepwalking through it. Um, they they just they have got so many young exciting players they've got sharp players they've got experienced players Kante and Pogba were fantastic um as they as they usually are Varane had moments that that um the way he looked real quality Benzema has done done his selection um Sorry, he's he's justified his selection. He's justified being brought back in. His movement was really good. He worked hard, um, but but uh, like it it wasn't coherent. They weren't all pushing together. And as I said, kind of at the beginning of the podcast, if you're not gonna work as hard as the other team, then you will get punished. And and that's that's what ended up happening. But actually, I'll be honest with Germany. The only game that I was disappointed in was the England game. I thought they they did far far more than the French in, in the opening game. I thought they were attacking. Like Didi Haman was was kind of slating them beforehand. He wasn't giving them much of a chance. If they had a, a you know a, a real hungry striker, you know, a, if they had a Lewandowski who who obviously plays for Bayern every week, if they had if they'd had a top striker like that, there, there's no way they'd have gone home. You know they've got they've got Werner who we know can't hit a can't hit a barn door with a banjo, and we've got uh, Muller who's on the on the older side. You know I know he's he's thirty one, but he's been around a long, long time. But they just don't have a, a killer up front, and 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 that was that was the difference. But they, I thought they actually played well in in all of their games. I thought they played well, and then turned up at England, and or I should say didn't turn up at England, and. Um, that was that was actually the disappointment, but I, I actually thought they were better than um than I kind of had in my head before before the tournament started. But um but yeah, can't even remember what Gaz's question was in the first place. Yeah, we were just kind of touching on the on the disappointments, I suppose. Um so yeah, just before we move on from that, um I just like that you were saying about Lewandowski, like Poland were someone I thought were gonna do quite well as well, and mm. entirely didn't turn up. Like even on the last day of the group stages, you know, obviously with the third the third place format, you know, it looked like maybe they were gonna sneak back in when they, they were two 0 down, but then Lewandowski grabbed those two. So you know, had they gotten the third, they would have qualified as the third place team. But obviously then it was too little too late and they did end up losing the game anyway. But I just thought they were so poor. I thought mm-hmm. um Gary, you you thought they wouldn't do very well in the tournament, um, where I I thought they would have been kind of one of the dark horses. Um, they really really just didn't turn up, you know. Even Le- Lewandowski, like fair enough, you know, he's not playing with maybe the caliber of player at Poland that he would be with uh, Bayern, but even still, he was in the absolute form of his life going into the tournament. I was expecting him to, you know still be able to, to drag them through kind of at least the group stages um, you know I, I had a better yeah, uh, what did you say sorry sorry it, it wasn't the toughest group that they went into you know I mean yeah between Slovakia and Spain and, and Sweden you know you would have definitely definitely thought like four goals in, in, the, in their three games uh, still more than England um, but four goals in their three games and two of them came in the last one. So, yeah, I mean, like, they couldn't have really had a more generous group. Um, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, 
Um, okay, so moving on from the dis disappointments, I suppose. Um, one that kind of popped into my head, um, I'd say it'll be a, a, a pretty quick discussion, but do we have any shouts for goal of the tournament so far, or is it just hands down it's going to be Schick's goal against Scotland? 100%. Is that you go, Gaz? I don't know, 100%, because just moments like, like tournaments are obviously remembered by more than likely the, the team that win it, and obviously this tournament will be remembered for what the Danish team did and came together and stuff like that, but goals are also remembered from tournaments, and Schick's goal against the, the Scots was... It was just pure genius. And I know people were criticizing the, the goalkeeper for being off the line, but that's kind of modern day football. The keeper's expected to be maybe not quite out that far, but I I just wouldn't blame the goalkeeper. It was just such a quality finish. Like how far did it look like it was going wide when he initially hit the ball and then the bend on it to, to go in? Unbelievable. Um, Yarmolenko, his goal against um, the Dutch was a quality, quality goal as well. But um Hazard's sure. goal against uh against Portugal was a was a cracker. There's been some yeah. some 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 great goals in, in the tournament and, and even like even Renato was a Ronaldo second against Hungary pretty much the, the the one two passes on the edge of the box and the and I know it was pretty much a tap in, in the end for Ronaldo but just that play was 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 quality. But um yeah no there's been some great goals. Shakiri's gotten Turned up with a, with another class tournament goal as well, so um, it's 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 been great to watch in, in terms of some of the goals that have been scored. Even the if you if you guys have a bit of time, scoot back and look at Turkey's goals. Like they didn't score many, but nearly each one of them was an absolute screamer. Like the, the, there was there has been some some super goals. The two goals Belgium scored against. Uh, against uh, Denmark were both like technically excellent goals like the work rate you know out of Lukaku from from both of them you know De Bruyne is uh, De Bruyne is dropping the shoulder and, and weighted pass like uh, just there, there have been some crackers uh, Sheik will probably it. take it but sorry Dad. I was just saying yeah that De Bruyne goal was absolutely beautiful or sorry, the one where he laid it on. Sorry, I I don't think he gets enough. Like I know he's a class, he's a quality player, but that goal didn't get. I don't think got enough credit because every majority of other players would have taken a shot in that moment, and his touch obviously filled two defenders, squared it for was it Hazard's okay. brother, um, the, the the real Hazard of of the tournament. But um, oh, no, that that was just ge just genius from Kevin De Bruyne. Actually, do you know the second goal? Um, they showed uh, they were shown it in um, in one of the RTE build-ups. The second goal uh, where uh, that De Bruyne scored, and Lukaku's work work to make that goal was just it was like what we dreamed of at United. <laughs> you know, he he was strong. He picked it up. He was oh, you know, just if you watch it back. That goal, he doesn't get the, the credit for that for that goal that he that he absolutely should because it's um th there's there's some there's some fantastic football, you know, in the the assist to the assist kind of thing. And we've seen it quite a bit in the in the Italy stuff, in the Italy games as well. Um, you know, we actually haven't mentioned Italy really all that much but uh they they've been they've been fantastic and some of the goals that they've scored um you know they, they they're just there's some crackers out there Schick will probably get the the goal of the tournament but there's been some real crackers it's just uh just interesting obviously that we haven't really touched on Italy too much um but I was just thinking there like Italy Italy don't just depend on on one or two players like it's it's a whole team effort where you potentially look at the Dutch and say when Aldum Depay maybe Dumfries to a certain extent in this tournament they very much depended and obviously you could say De Jong in in midfield who actually was was quality in the in the group stage and, and what he did and um, but they're very much dependent on certain players and you could even say the same maybe for for France um, a couple of other nations as, as, as well 
Um, but I just think, again, you look at Italy, it's just such a, a, a team effort. It's a togetherness. You hear them, it's like, it's a joy to, to watch them singing the national anthem and how much <laughs> of a unit they, the Italians are. Um, and I, to be honest, you kind of look at England and think the same. Like at the moment, maybe coming into the tournament, I think they might be, have been dependent on Harry Kane or they might have been dependent on a Jack Grealish or, or a certain individual, but it's very much been a team effort from England. Um, and I honestly, I don't think Southgate is getting the, the praise that he deserves. Um, I probably don't, like, I know we were saying they haven't been the most exciting team to watch the English, but they're getting they're getting the the results like how many and obviously the fact that everyone's crying out for for Sega to play his best players so to play his best team which involves a Grealish a Foden um by dropping maybe um a Phillips or a Declan Rice more than likely a Phillips but how many times in the past has an England English manager gone in and tried to play the best players on the pitch and it just didn't work so I think Southgate deserves a lot of credit, number one as well, for, for sticking with Sterling, because I pulled my hands up and didn't think he probably warranted a, a starting jersey in the first game. His performance was, 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 was decent enough, I thought, in the first game. And then I kind of thought maybe a Grealish or someone else could come in and, and perform even better. But he stuck with him. He's 15 goals in 20 games for, for England in the, in the last 20 games. 15 goals, so... You can understand why um, Southgate's sticking with him. But I just think he's, he's not getting the, the, the credit that he deserves. He's, he's been brave in his decisions. He's probably utilised, maybe with the exception to the Italians, because obviously their last game, they made a lot, a lot of changes. But he's changed formation. He's changed personnel. And they've gotten the results bar, we'll say, the, the Scottish game, which was a huge disappointment and they probably should have lost. But... Again, you look at that Croatia game, you look at the, the Germany game. In the past, they would have been, we'll say, 1-0 up and they wouldn't have had any idea how to hold on to, to a lead. I remember the games against, um, was it France at a, at a Euros where they were 1-0 up and then conceded a couple of goals late on. I think it was Euro 2000. And it was something similar, actually. It wasn't against Portugal as well, where England might have been 2-0 up as well and the, the true way... Uh, a lead um i think something similar might have been against romania as well so he's he he's instilled whatever he's instilled into this into this english team that they're 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 able to see out games and again whether it's one nil at the end of the day they're in a quarter final and the likes of france portugal germany aren't for trying to play bright attacking football all the time I don't know whether you agree or not. But. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, my, my point of view, I'm not a big fan of Southgate or England. Um, I I think with the players he has at his disposal, he should be trying to, you know, have the likes of Sancho or Grealish playing more more regularly because they're just, I think, far better quality players than than he ends up seeming to pick. But the the annoying thing about my point of view is it's being disproven because they're playing what I think is, you know, really not enjoyable football to watch and scraping through. But look, they're getting the job done during the quarterfinals. You know, you could say they could still go up a gear, you know. Um, and like you said, like some of the bigger teams are already gone. So they're already one of the, they're one of the biggest teams left, really. What, what, what about... Again, everyone's crying out for Grealish, and I was crying out for Grealish. He's been my favourite player to watch in the Premier League. You guys know that, because I've mentioned it numerous times on, on these podcasts. But it just seems to be such a, a genius... I don't say genius move, because he's one of your best players. You're bringing one of your best players off the bench. But he has an impact every single time. And you just wonder, in playing for England, and even in the build-up, he was probably their, their best player in the couple of games even the ones that he that he started, but he just has such an impact from, from the bench that can we really question, can people really question Southgate's decision-making there? As, as Dave said, at the moment, probably not, but 
And I'm sure there's a lot of people that still would question. Him. But at the end of the day, if we'll say if England were to 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 win, and which they probably have a better chance than than they've ever had before, um, if if they win it, no one's going to care how you play. Like when you think back, Greece weren't very attractive to the eye from what I can remember. Even France, to a certain extent, when they won the World Cup, I think they had like moments as well. Like, yeah, they they probably were the the, the standout team just about but the warrant from what memory serves might it could be completely wrong but um the warrant's kind of setting the world alight so if you can get through games if you can win games that's the most important thing at the end of the day and they've obviously what, what the day say scored three four goals and um, but they haven't conceded any and if you don't concede you have a better chance of winning a football match um right uh i I can take your I can take your points on board. Um, uh, he's he is a, a he's an okay manager. He he's he's fine. Um, like yes, under the current circumstances, um, you're you're right. It is being uh, it has been disproven, but he is probably the only manager in the tournament, even before knockout stages, he's probably the only one who doesn't know his 11, um, or, or at least 90% of it. He doesn't, he, he doesn't, it changes from week, to, from, from game to game. So, you know, Pickford is always going to play, you know, Ster- well, you know, Sterling's going to play, you know, Kane's going to play. And everybody else is subject to, to switching around, moving about, coming in, coming out. Um, you know, it, he has a huge selection of extremely talented players. Um, Trippier was obviously brought in for the first game, and the, the Croatia game was actually a very good game of football. You know, against uh, against an old enemy, and obviously they didn't want to be didn't want to be embarrassed again. And uh, and obviously that's an aging Croatia team, but they came out and they played with far more energy against Croatia than they've played since. Um they were they were exciting and it was a it was a great game to watch. And um you know since then okay so they've played Croatia, they've played the Czech Republic, they've played Scotland and they've played Germany. So there's no question that it uh, sorry England should be should be where they are with those games you know germany is a is a real is a real notch that's a, that's a real um scalp that he's gotten you know that that would be arguably if you're an england fan you're probably saying that's the first big team that they've that they've beaten even even stretching back to the world cup so um i've heard it from england fans you know who have you beaten you know, we've beaten Panama, we've beaten Colombia, you know, we've beaten all these, you know, these minnow sort of con- countries and didn't beat Scotland and just just edged this past Czech Republic. Um, I don't want to take, I don't want to take away from that because you're right, it is a cup competition and all that matters is that you, is, is how you, how you, not how you get there, is that you get there. Um I think they're going to have a real tough time with Denmark if they get past the Ukraine. Um, Ukraine are going to be really, really difficult to uh, to to break down. You know, I mean, I know that they can that they can concede that they conceded a deflection last night, but they they're going to give them a real, real tough time. Shevchenko has done a pretty a pretty impressive job. Um, uh, at Ukraine, so you know, getting past them, and then they have to get past Denmark, and then, and we've touched on it already. Denmark are not are not here to make up the numbers. They are passionate, and they are pressing, and they're working hard, and a really passionate pressing team against this England side will will be a huge achievement if they if they manage to to get past them. So. I, I, listen, I, I do think he deserves credit. I also don't deserve... He, I think he deserves the hard time or the abuse that he gets either. But, listen, Jaden Sancho's probably played about, about 25 minutes 
now like he is an exceptional player he's you know when you want a goal and and they've needed them when he's so creative he's so he's so um he's everything that he that he needs it, it's it's strange that he hasn't hasn't played much jack Grealish, you would think you know he's when we need the goal he comes on and he's pretty much created everything so would you not expect him to get in a little bit uh, a little bit earlier or to get a start like i i don't know um he doesn't deserve the abuse that he gets but i also wouldn't be too you know run away with it either i think he's gonna he's gonna have some really tough tests in the next uh, round or two if the, if they get to the semis and then and then if they get to a final, which will be, you know, obviously they would be made up with themselves, you know, a really, really tough Italian team um, that don't concede goals really, like one in 11 or something, um, haven't lost in 30. You know, that they've got a they've got a tough road. They do have a tough road. But listen, he's got that squad for a reason. And, you know, he can switch and change and divvy it in and out as, as much as he needs to, he feels he needs to I think he maybe just tinkers with it more than he than he really needs to Yeah, and Kyle no, Walker I, I don't know how that happened, sorry Kyle Walker is just an, an awful defender, I, I don't understand his pace, um, his pace makes up for his lack of I don't know I yeah, awareness <laughs> that Sure, like it gets him out of trouble sometimes, but Kieran Trippier is a far better right back. He gives you super uh, service in the air, uh, where you obviously want to be getting it to Kane, you want to be getting it to Maguire, you want to be getting it to Stones in the air. You know, I, I don't think that his pace justifies why why he shouldn't be there ahead of a lad who's just won La Liga uh, in a a fantastically defensive minded Atletico team. I don't I don't get it, but and, it keeps getting results. And I have to say, like that is a very interesting point that Dave makes because we'd we'll say in the, the first couple of games it seemed like Sake wasn't really allowing the, the fullbacks to, to push on or bomb on as much. So if you're looking from a defensive perspective, Trippier is you're right back potentially obviously again we could have had a debate if Trent Alexander-Arnold was was in that squad but obviously talking with the, the squad that's there it would make sense for Trippier to to play in that position but maybe potentially Kyle Walker if they're um if Southgate's allowing the full backs or the wing backs to, to bomb on forward and in the first game he played Trippier on the left like a position he's never played before. It was it was just all all very much like it was Pep Roulette esque. Uh but like you just don't know what where the play no not if the player's gonna play, but if they're gonna where they're gonna play. Like could they they could be anywhere, you know. Yeah. You know thing, actually I will give credit. I will give credit to Southgate. I have been a huge critic of Pickford. Uh I I I don't rate him. I really don't. Um, and people have said that, you know, Pickford is there for the style of football that he plays. And I don't think Pickford can do something that Dean Henderson can't. But he has been impressive. And he he made some some really good saves in the Czech game and in uh, against the Germans. Yeah, his, his, uh, his save against Kimmich, I think it was. Um, he, he's made a couple of really good saves. So he's... Uh, He's been justified in in standing by Pickford and, and Sterling, so he deserves credit for that. Yeah, 100%. Um, I suppose just before we wrap up, um, if we cover one or two uh, little things else, I was just going to say before we kind of, you know, predict how the tournament's going to finish up, um, if you could kind of briefly um, have a quick chat of who has there been any, who, who have been the kind of standout one or two players for you um, I suppose if you had a quick look at the the current, you know, leaders in the goal scoring charts, obviously Ronaldo is top with five, but then Schick is fourth. So like like me personally, I hadn't I don't think I had heard of Schick before. Um, you know, so it's a similar story to 
I suppose even, you know, when Czech Republic did well, I think, was it in Euro 2004? You know, they had the likes of Baros doing very well. Um, and was it Karisteas got the winner for Greece? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I suppose obviously Schick now is, is far more well known with, with his absolute amazing goal and, you know, doing the hunt for top scorer. Um, Dave, if you kind of quickly, who, who's been one or two players that have caught your eye? Uh, three I've really enjoyed. Um, I, I I thought Dumfries was a was nearly like a revelation um, for the Dutch. I thought he was exceptional, so brave and and fast, and he can. Jesus, such a clever player. Um, the rest are nearly Italian. Spinazzola, what a what a fullback! Like he's, I can't believe I didn't spot him. You know, considering that you know United played Roma twice. Well, we did score. <laughs> whatever ridiculous amount of goals against them so you potentially yeah. wouldn't have their, <laughs> you probably uh, looking for the defenders but he's been exceptional he's been, he's been really really good um and Locatelli who doesn't start for Italy he, he always he always comes on Locatelli has been has been impressive uh Chiesa has also been impressive another one who doesn't start either um and I I swear I love the Italians, but oh, the the last group game I can't remember who they played. Um, but Bastoni came in and played with with Benucci as a at centre back, and he's only nineteen years of age, but he was so calm, so solid, so confident. Um, really unusual to see in a in a young centre back, but he certainly didn't look. Look at out of place. There's been some really, really good performers, but those ones just come to mind. Guys, who's stood out for you? Um, I have to agree, obviously, with Dave. Spinozola has been a revelation. Um, breath of fresh air to, to 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 see like every game he's up and down that line, like like his life depends on it. Like he's getting back into position to defend, but he's also getting up to be an attacking position. I think he's gotten an assist or two, possibly. Um, but he's probably should have had a couple of more assists along the way. Dumfries as well. There's always that. There's always that one player in a tournament where you haven't heard of him. And I know you mentioned O'Hara Schick, but Dumfries, I don't know anyone had heard of him pre-tournament. And as a wing back and his positional sense to get in scoring positions, um, two goals, was it? And a couple of assists as well for... um yeah, for, for the penalty as well. Yeah, which was, which was quite impressive. Only thing was lacking potentially was his defensive duties at times, but from an attacking perspective, he was a joy to watch. A um, couple of other mentions, I suppose, I think I might have mentioned it to, to you guys in, in the group, but Wijnaldum, I just thought he was incredible. I know they're, they're knocked out now, but he was, like, he was like a different player that he went to another level with the Dutch because... I don't know whether it's that responsibility of, of leading him as, as captain, his change of position as well. And he just he just dragged that team. Like, I, I know that, that they did quite well in the group stages, but he was just phenomenal I'm getting forward, creating chances, getting into scoring positions. Um, really, really impressed by, by him. Pogba obviously had very good games as well, really, really top-class moments. Um, but I think Pedri as well for, for the Spanish has been considering. I think he is the youngest player at the tournament to, to be starting. Um, and I know he had that disaster moment, obviously, with the, the own goal. But you, it, was, it was like, it was almost like he turned around and said, fuck that, that wasn't my own goal. I'm not being responsible for that. I'm going to drag this team back to, to getting um, back into the game and then... Um, coming out with a victory from from the game, so I think Pedri deserves a, an honourable mention. But um, Spinazzola, um, I think, has been my player of the tournament so far. I don't know about you guys, but uh, Jorginho, like I've never seen him play like that at Chelsea. Like I'm sure that's the that's the Jorginho they they thought they were that they thought they were signing. Like I, I know he's had a decent. Chelsea have had a decent end to the season, but he's been he's been outstanding. You know, it's uh, it's crazy how some of these players once they get into their into their national teams, how they how they transform. I know you you've mentioned Pogba, and that's we've we've talked about that for for a long long time. But um, but yeah, they get into their teams, and and you know they're just. 
they just gel differently. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with you with Jorginho as well. Like, as you said, like as a whole, Italy have looked so solid and so strong. Um, but yeah, it's bizarre to see Jorginho actually, you know, looking like a, a fully functional midfielder where often I wouldn't really rate him at Chelsea. But yeah, as you said, like it, 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 that must be the form he was he was playing in Italy because sure, weren't uh, Pep really wanted him at City as well at that stage when Chelsea bought him. So, um, yeah, I think Italy Italy are definitely one of the strongest ones left in it. And he's like, has been really. He, he looks like a like he'll be a player. Um, I think he's with Sociedad. Who is that? Sorry, Dev. Uh, Isak. Oh um, yeah, with Sweden, yeah, he looks a very good player. He looks sharp, yeah, yeah, and he's only a kid, and he's only signed for a couple of million recently, but um, yeah, he looks like he's a he'll be a player. Yeah. Oh, Harry, would you add anyone else to the to the list? I was actually thinking Forsberg as well for for Sweden when you mentioned Sweden there. He's been a yeah standout performer, but uh, would you add add anyone else to to that list? Yeah, Forsberg has been very good. Um, I had heard of him, excuse me, but um, you know, obviously limited. In you know, in in when I had seen him, but yeah, he's been very good for Sweden. Um, obviously, unfortunately, they're out now as well. Um, yeah, sh- like Sheik has been very impressive for Czech Republic. You know, again, you know, kind of typical Czech Republic player in that they're all they all seem to just be really solid players. Um, Lukaku has been. I thought I actually thought Lukaku would be more explosive. Um. You know, he has his three goals and obviously is still in the tournament, so has a chance of, of sneaking up to top score. But um, I want really, really, it's hard to look past just generally any player on the Italy team, in my opinion. Like <laughs> Italy just as a whole have been have been so impressive. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll move on to, to the last segment now. Um, so kind of rounding up the, the tournament. How do we see the quarterfinals onwards um, playing out? So obviously for the listeners, the, the four quarterfinals we have left are Switzerland v Spain, Belgium, Italy, which in my opinion, I think the winner of that game, I think will go on and win the tournament. Obviously, I'm up for Italy. Um, I actually got them, as I said in the last podcast, I got them in a sweep in work and kind of had my eye on them before the tournament anyway. But, you know, Belgium have looked strong. So I think it'll be a tight match. So I think the winner of that would probably win the tournament. But then, yeah, the other two quarterfinals are Czech Republic v Denmark and Ukraine and England. So I suppose just briefly, guys, what do we think? How do we think the tournament is going to unfold? Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, I agree with your take on the on the Italy-Belgium um, winners. I, I think they will be the ones to to uh, to win it in the end. Um I I can see Spain sneaking past uh, into the into the semis, um, not convincingly again. I think they'll they'll just uh, they'll, they'll they'll wiggle it. Um, Italy, I watched the the Austria Italy and Austria game, and you know they've shown that they can might take extra time, but they can break down a, a low block. They can break down a team that's going to. That's going to sit back. Um, Belgium can't do that because they have got Vertonghen, Alderweireld, and um, I can't remember their third fullback, uh, sorry, centre back, but they play with a back three. Uh, if they do that against the Italians, I would, I would expect the Italians to absolutely take them apart. And then it'll just be about who can outscore who. Um, and as we've said already, Italy has conceded one. One and eleven, and and uh, are on a thirty-one game unbeaten streak. Denmark will more. I would. I would like Denmark to get to the final. I really would. <laughs> it would just be. And we didn't mention any of the Danish players, but they've they've uh, they've really all pulled together, and they've all you know just been just been fantastic. Uh, I as much as I would like Denmark to get to the final, I I also wouldn't be surprised if England got there, but. Um, Italy for the win, I think. That's true, actually. Yeah, just as you touched, I totally forgot about the Danish players. It, just off the top of my head, even both Damsgaard and uh, the fullback Moila have been sensational. And again, 
two players I had never heard of. Um, so obviously it's it's nice having you know young players you hadn't heard of really kind of stepping up even at a young age. I'm pretty sure Damsgaard is is still only a teenager as well. But um, I, I remember I, I remember Dahlberg starting it uh, for for Ajax a couple of years ago against. Uh, Against United in the in the Europa League final, and he's he's one of those strikers who doesn't necessarily he's not a he's not a Holland he's like he's not a, a goal hungry striker, but he he works in with the team. He's a, he's a bit like a Morata, I guess. But even him chipping in with with a couple of goals and two two very well taken goals as well, you know, and they uh, they're like they're the essence of of what a team is, you know. Between them and Italy, are, they've just been the best. Um, like everything, like they they're so cohesive. They all they all work their asses off for each other. So, um, yeah, no, I, I it's 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 the underdog story. I'd love it. I'd, I'd love Denmark too. And you know, it, it would be uh, it would be a great story. But yeah, it's um, they've got some great lads. Yeah, they do. Guys, final word. How do you think the tournament's gonna go? It's um, it's it's interesting when you look at the quarter final lineup because probably only. Belgium on paper probably only Belgium and Italy is a standout fixture and normally kind of quarterfinal stages you're expecting I don't know France v England uh, Italy v Portugal uh, Germany v another top nation maybe the the Netherlands or someone like that so it does make for a really interesting because straight away Belgium Italy who are probably the two favorites out of the last eight one of them's gone so like Bodhi said, whoever wins that probably wins the Euros. Um, but again, based on what I've predicted so far and what probably a lot of people have predicted, you wouldn't be surprised if if a Switzerland overcame Spain, kind of similar how they overcame uh, the French. Um, possibly you could see an upset with Ukraine against England. Personally, I, I don't think so. And then I think the Denmark-Czech Republic game again, just based on how both countries have performed so far, is a really, really interesting game. Again, you look at it on paper and you wouldn't think it would be interesting, but I think based on how both teams have performed, it is a really interesting one. Probably can see Italy just about scraping by Belgium. Um, as, as they've mentioned, they've been able to, to push through in extra time against obviously the, the Austrians. They've kind of swept aside all other teams in the, in the group stages even with their, their, their second 11 out on the pitch. Um, I'm going to probably be bold and call a, a Switzerland win over Spain. Um, again, I would never, have, it, I don't even think I predict Switzerland to get out of the group, but if Spain kind of continue to play the way they played in the group stages, where it's, as we, myself and Dave were having a little chat off air, I, at one stage I thought Lou Van Gaal was, was managing Spain with the passing from, from one side of the pitch to the other and back and forth and back and forth. And there was, there was nothing in, in an attacking sense, really. So if they can up their game, Spain, they can, obviously they, they, they can win, they've, they've more quality. But Switzerland, if they have a low block again and manage to scrape a goal and, and potentially hold on, because you saw how the Spanish struggled against uh, Sweden and struggled against um, was it Poland in the, in the, the second game. Then England, Ukraine, probably can only see a, an English win. Again, momentum is very much with them after that, that win against Germany yesterday. Um, and I think we'd, we'd just all love to see Denmark getting it to, making it to, to the final and potentially potentially winning it. So, I don't know. Italy, I'm going to call Italy. What, what I want is an Italy-Denmark final, but I think it'll be an Italy-England um, final with Italy to win it. Brilliant. There we have it. So yeah, I think it's Italy all around, full house. Yeah, I think um, it's very hard to look past Italy. Um, I'd love, like you said, I'd love Denmark to be the ones to get to the final from the other side. Um, but again, if England, you know, kind of put a decent run together, they obviously have the players to, you know, see see Denmark out of the group, out of the tournament. Um, but yeah, fingers crossed for an Italy win. Um, so yeah, so there we go. I think we'll give that a round up. Um, so we're looking at Italy to win, hopefully, or maybe a fairy tale story for Denmark. So thanks a million, guys, and Dave. That's been really enjoyable. So let's look forward to the next 
a week or two of the Euros and yeah, then it'll only be a month to go until the Premier League. <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks so much, guys. Cheers, lads.